a very warm good evening to all of you welcome to the 239 session of center webinar series for teachers we have a great content prepared for you today the topic for today's webinar is using poetry for teaching english and the facilitator for this session is ms alokpana das ms alokpana das is a poet and a educationist and a writer she wants children to lose their fear for of poetry and instead enjoy it she has about more than 25 years of work experience more than 20 of these in education she has been educa educated in india us and thailand and holds a master degree in linguistics from george Ma uh, mason university us and master degree in english literature in delhi university she has taught linguistic and esl in marymount university and george university in you in the us and has taught grade 9 to 12 in iv and igcse board in india she has been head of contact at the teachers foundation where she has facilitated teachers training as well she has written a story and poems for children for a curricular called teaching reading through storytelling she has also published her own book will the center holds a collection of light hearted poems and has been published in different anthologies she thinks that the poetry is a great but under utilized tool to teach english or uh, any other language and hence she will talk about that today welcome mm -hmm. madam before i hand over the session to the facilitator i would like to in inform that all teachers that will receive participation certification for the session so please do fill out the feedback form that will be shared with you towards the end of the session it's over to you alok panna thank you so much varsha and thank you for having me on sent talks i'm really delighted to be on the center platform conducting this webinar on using poetry to teach english and i'd like to start by wishing you all a very happy world poetry day because uh, today march 21st is world poetry day as declared by unesco so what a wonderful day to actually uh, understand how to use poetry to teach english uh, i'd like to welcome you all with this with an invitation by shel silverstein if you are a dreamer come in if you are a dreamer a wisher a liar a hoper a prayer a magic bean buyer If you are a pretender come sit by my fire for we have some flax golden tales to spin come in come in my earliest memories are of my mother singing and reciting rabindranath tagore songs and poems to me so poetry is my first love however i do know that poetry is scary students are terrified of it teachers find it difficult to teach and uh, most people think that poets are mad however today i would like to show you that poetry is nothing but a tool and a very very simple and enjoyable tool for teaching language not just english but any other language so let's look at today's agenda teaching language with rhyme and reason so the rhyme and re rhyme rhythm and reason behind teaching poetry rhymes in each class and season vocabulary building and other advices figurative language uh, figuring figurative devices figurative language in everyday life and finally poetry is a pleasure not a strife so these are the things we are going to cover in today's uh, webinar rhyme rhythm and reason there are many reasons for using poems and rhymes for teaching english or for teaching any other language what do you think how do you think poetry helps well it helps in student improving student literacy it is a very very powerful teaching tool there are there are different ways right poetry first of all helps us express emotions and it helps us show empathy well then there is the power of rhyme we'll get to that a big secret right how can rhyme have power but rhyme has huge power poetry is there for us to have you know learn vocabulary to introduce voc vocabulary to understand vocabulary the different ways 
and then we will look at how poetry helps students navigate through language easily. But let's look at this poem. Let's first start with expressing emotions and how poetry helps us empathize. So there's this poem, a very favorite poem of mine. I'm sure many, many of you have, you know, read it as a child, as a teacher, as a grown up. It's apart from a poison tree. I was angry with my friend. I told my wrath, my wrath did end. I was angry with my foe. I told it not, my wrath did grow. So what kind of emotion is the poem Poison Tree bringing out? I'm sure some of you can, you know, put it in the chat. What kind of emotions do you think the poem Poison Tree is bringing out? Okay, I think the emotions are of anger, right? But by expressing that anger, yes, Kriti has written anger, uh, Castor has written anger, a lot of them have written anger. You're right, it's a poem about anger. And if you, uh, as we, we, you know, we can show that we are reducing the anger or reducing the violent expression of anger if we express it. But if we don't express it, what happens? It, it, it builds towards an explosion. Let us read another poem. This is She and Me. This is by Rose O'Fletch. She smiles, I cry. She's brave, I'm shy. She loves, I'm alone. She's amazing, I'm unknown. She's beautiful, I'm a mess. She's happy, I'm depressed. She's a fake, I'm real. My mask is perfect, she hides me. So what do you think this poem is talking about? Let's have some uh, answers in the chat. What do you think she and me is about? And what do you, what sense do you think children will make out of it? Do you think children will be able to uh, connect to this poem or relate? Yes, loneliness, character. There's envy, right? Envy of the mask, right? What I show and what I am. How very beautifully put what I show and what I am. So do you think students will relate to this poem? Do you think students will be able to write a poem like this? This is a very simple one compared to say, you know, the poison tree. Very simple word structure. So what we are doing is we are using poems to not only show emotions, but if we encourage our students to start writing. Yes, there's so many beautiful, right? It will be a way of absolutely a way of self criticism. It is a way of, you know, showing your emotional well being. It, as Rohini says, it brings out the inner personality, the person unknown. True. So, what are we doing? We are allowing our children, or rather, we are giving our children a medium to express themselves. Now, Robert Frost has said poetry is when an emotion has found its thought and the thought has found its words. So, through poetry, you know, when we introduce poetry, just through this, like the very first, uh, this thing of emotions, we are allowing our children to, uh, you know, express that emotion or to empathize. That's just one part of poetry. I'm just going to take you to the different parts. And now this one, the power of rhyme. Do you think rhyme has power? Why did I say power of rhyme? Why do you think we said rhyme, you know, rhyme has power? Would you like to share your thoughts on the chat, please? I think I've given you a hint here. Rhyme is older than the written word. Yes. So even before human beings discovered or invented writing, even before the scripts came up, right? you know, your hieroglyphics or your just general scripts, there was rhyme. Um, how did, you know, people before they began to write, how did they pass on their information, their knowledge, their wisdom from one generation to another? Absolutely, through tune, through rhyme, through, uh, you know, through pattern, through music. If you think of it, all the oral traditions, right? These are pre-writing. 
and our Vedas, just our Vedas themselves before they were written down, were actually passed on from generation to generation through rhymes. After all, it's easier to remember rhymes than paragraphs. Absolutely, it connects to the listening sense. It creates a musical element. It's through poems, songs. We, we learned to you know, transfer our knowledge through poems, through songs, before we actually put it down into writing. So uh, I think I mean, even our proverbs, right? Things like a stitch in time saves nine. These are very, very pithy, succinct. So it's much easier to remember rhymes, which is why I say the power of rhyme. Now, our children use rhymes to learn language. If you look at little children, when do they learn to speak? When do they learn to, you know, at a few months, like a year old, they're already you know, saying words. By two years, they're, they're, you know, remembering rhymes, remembering songs, reciting them for you. But have they learned to read and write? No, not at all. Why is that? I mean, not why are they not reading and writing, but why is it that children use rhymes to learn language? I think uh, we have a lovely uh, statement here from Ashish Avasti because it makes, uh, you know, whatever this, this, uh, this language more interesting and more attract, uh, attract, attractive, right? And more uh, impactful. So children learn to use rhymes very early on before you know they're, you know, uh, spouting out little poems, little uh, whatever nursery rhymes we teach them, they can, uh, you know, easily recite them. So we use poetry to teach, you know, automatically we start using poetry to teach language. But by the time they're a little older, we sort of let go, right? We don't use language, poetry anymore to teach language. We think of poetry as something to do with, you know, as a separate thing that we have to teach. Let's let's start with little children. Let's see how we use rhyme and rhythm in phonics. This is for pre-primary classes, right? We will get to the different levels. We're just starting with pre-primary. We'll move on to primary. We'll move on to uh, older children. And we'll also move on to ourselves as teachers. So let's start with this using rhyme and rhythm in phonics. Uh, on, the, on the screen, you can see these three, right? Substituting sounds, syllabication, decoding. So what happens for substituting sounds when we are teaching children to read, right? We give them three letter words, map, gap, pot, lot. What are they doing? They're substituting the consonant sound, initially the first one, then, you know, the end one. This is nothing but rhymes, right? All your words, map, gap, hop, mop, dog. So we, we are helping, like phonics uses this specifically to teach English. We also use uh, syllabication when we are trying to teach uh, phonics, when we are trying to teach the child to read. We are helping them understand, get the rhythm of the language, right? I mean, even in a class, in a nursery class, when we ask children, what is your name? Susan. How do we break it? Susan, right? In, in two sounds. What is your name? Rahul. Sunday. Saturday. Like we break it in three, we break it in two. That's what we are doing. We then carry that on to longer sentences. The sun set, the moon rose red, right? So each sentence has a different syllabic pattern. And we are helping our children right from pre-primary stage to identify those, to understand how the sound of language works. And this will come in handy, right? When they start speaking themselves, when and as they go, grow older, as they internalize it, the way they you know, do their declamations, the way they do their, um, you know, uh, recitations, all of this will depend on this. Now let's look at decoding. When children are starting to read, when they're starting to read, you know, like decode the sounds and turn them into words, how is poet, uh, how is, you know, rhyming and rhythming helping there? Well, they're using it to sound out words. They're using it to sound out words, they're using it to make predictions while learning, uh, learning the words. They're understanding pitch and intonation, right? Through substituting words, they were sounding out words. They were making predictions that, okay, if I substitute one consonant with another, I'll have the same sound, but slightly different. Then the syllabication helps them with pitch, with intonation. And then, of course, all of this put together helps them understand language structure. 
So poetry for students, you know, say, let's say we move into the primary and middle section. We've moved from the pre-primary. Now we move into the primary and middle section. So there are different things we can do with poetry. You know, we can use it for language, for vocabulary. Uh, we can use it for ideas, for context. So, you know, for language and vocabulary, we can introduce or practice new vocabulary. We can understand the language structures as many of you had put in. Uh, we can understand, help them understand literary devices. Absolutely. Yeah. And then when we go into ideas and contexts, we actually make, give them a manageable amount of text in their early child school, right? In our primary. It's a more manageable amount of text in which to explore ideas. Because initially, we don't introduce them to longer poems. Of course, as they grow older, the longer poems come in. But we start out with a very manageable amount of text. We open up historical and cultural windows for them through poems. And of course, they learn to appreciate their own and others' emotions, cultures, and heritage. So I think some of you have written, uh, Varalakshmi has written, language makes them feel fun. Yes, absolutely. I mean, poetry itself makes la language learning fun. And there is also fun in understanding a poem, right? So let's see. Uh, language and vocabulary. Let's, let's look at how we can use poetry in middle and higher grades to teach language and vocabulary. So, you know, we can introduce a new vocabulary. How do we start? We read the word. And then what happens? You ask the children, how does the word make you feel? Look at the word and, you know, like just go through it just just read it out how does it make you feel listen to the word listen to the sound you can ask students to pair up one can say the word out the other one can close their eyes how does the you know word sound what sound does the word convey so those are the things those are the techniques you can use to help the child understand the word or at least uh, take pleasure in the word try to understand the meaning from the context right so what is the what picture does the context build? The, I am sure the poem is building up some kind of a context. And what picture does it build? Can you think of a synonym for the word? Like you can ask the children, think of a synonym. Guess a synonym. And if you replace that particular word with the synonym, will it still mean and feel the same? That's something, again, the children can you know, play with. What if they, you know, instead of big, they use huge or instead of small, they use tiny. How will it change the context or the meaning of the poem? Can you think of an antonym for the word? An opposite? What if you use the antonym to replace it, you know, replace the word? What will happen to that poem? Will it completely change meaning? So I've given you a lot of these, uh, you know, statements on the screen. But now let's see how it actually applies to a poem. So let's look at this poem by, you know, it's a very famous poem by Robert Frost, that a word, the road not taken. And the, there are two words in it that are, you know, in red. So two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the underwood. So this poem here, I mean, there are, there there is a reason there are there's a reason I've marked these two words in red. Of course, I, these are the ones we are going to look at. So what is the context? First, let's 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 look at the context of the poems. Poem before we decide, you know, before we look into a dictionary to understand the meaning of the word diversion. This is how I would teach it to my students. So what are the two? You know, words, what are the words that lead to diverge? Two roads, so that means two roads, you know, and there is a boat. So automatically, what does that word remind you of? Does it remind you of a division? Would there be a connection with division between diverged and division? What about the word undergrowth? Is there something growing underneath the road? Is it, is the road underneath the growth? So these are the things that, you know, your students can think about. And what do we do? Well, we can, you know, then practice the vocabulary. What we, we take the word, we take the word diverged or we take the word uh, undergrowth and let's, let's put it on our word wall, right? 
And of course, this word wall doesn't have those words. I'm just giving you an example of how you use it on a word wall. Um, then what do you do with it? You create a word cloud or a word bubble of synonyms. Now, look at this, diverged. There are so many different words along with it, right? Parted, deviated, straight, split, separated, rambled. I mean, it, it's, it's, this is endless. Could we use one for the other? Let's see. What about undergrowth? You know, there are other words, underwood, thicket, copse, scrub. So can we use these words in a sentence of our own? I mean, you could just go to the board and draw a line and show how the line is diverging. Two lines diverge in a diagram. What about the antonym? Could you use the antonym? And would it still mean the same? Of course, it wouldn't mean the same. What I'm saying is, how would it change the meaning? Could you use the antonym in a different, you know, in a sentence of the, could the children use an antonym in their own words? Of course, they could do that, right? So you do the same way, says Munawar Sultana. Lovely, very nice, right? And you're going to choose that might be right or not. Absolutely. And we are going to see that. So, yeah, we have one word, merged. So, yes. So two roads parted in a yellow wood. Does that sound the same? Two roads strayed in a yellow wood. That may or may not be right, right? That may not, may or may not sound right. What about the word for undergrowth? We've used to where it bent in the thicket. Now, one of the things of this poem is that it rhymes and thicket would not rhyme with both, just like undergrowth did. So that's again something that the children can think about. Would rhyme make a difference? Is it because that word was rhyming that Robert Frost used it? So these are the kind of things that you can make the children think of when you're using poetry. I mean, and going beyond the word itself. How about using poems for word and concept association? Now, have you, I, I'm sure all of you have word of, uh, oh, we have words like disunite, uh, creates an echo in the poem which can leave a lasting effect on the audience, says Nidhi. Absolutely. And this is why poets have chosen or selected certain words rather than the others. And that's what we are trying to understand, help the children understand. Now let's look at uh, how we can use poems for word and concept association. I'm sure uh, some of you have heard of the, poem, of the word sinking. C-I-N-Q-U-A-I-N. -I -I now, Sinkain is a type of a poem that uh, has a very, very specific structure. And I'm going to show you an example of how we can use this for, you know, teaching new vocabulary. So the first line has two syllables. The second line has four syllables. The third line has six syllables. The fourth line has eight syllables. The fifth line has two syllables again. And how do we write one? Well, there's a lot of, you know, prose out there. First line, a single word, the subject and the title. The second line will have two adjectives that describe. The third line will have three words that either tell more, you know. So it can take various formations. I mean, if you look up Sinkane, C-I-N-Q-U-A-I-N, yes, limerick is also varied. Absolutely. It's a word, poem of five lines. Fourth line has a phrase to show emotion. You know, or further describe the subject and the fifth line can be a synonym of the title or a related word. So, uh, I mean, but when we look at the prose, I just want you to think about it. Look at the prose here. And it does look a little, uh, you know, scary, doesn't it? So many words. But if we look at a simple syncane, erosion, wind, water, heat, blowing, falling, blasting. Over age, ages forming formations, weathering. I mean, that's something you could easily teach in a in an EVS class, right? So you could use your poetry. I mean, you could use this for volcanoes. You could use this for all kinds of subjects like that, especially in that, you know, from, say, grade two onwards to grade six onwards, children will really enjoy working on this, right? Uh, okay, yes, limerick will certainly help. And now let's look at the other one. This one is a math one. Okay, and math. How can you use poetry in math? Well, we are going to see that. So we have something on fractions. Fractions, parts, chunks, factions, fragmenting, segmenting, dividing, halves, quarters, one-thirds, other sections, portions. 
right? So, so many words. It's a math, uh, this thing, uh, you know, it's a math uh, session or it's a math class in your grade three, grade four. And it can suddenly become fun because here they are, you know, writing a poem about fractions. So, uh, yes, as Ashima has said, thank you, Ashima. Especially since today is International Poetry Day, let's use poetry to teach every language, you know, every subject possible, science, math, why should there be a, uh, you know, limitation? So, uh, I have here now a poem on pronunciation and spelling by T.S. Watt, to just to show how difficult English can be. And this is to bring to attention for your older students, uh, this, uh, you know, the vagaries of the, and the inconsistencies inconsistencies, the exceptions in English spelling, in English language spelling. So uh, I'll just read it out because I know it may not be very visible. I take it you already know of touch and bow and cuff and dough. Others may stumble, but not you on hiccup, thorough, laugh and through. Well done. And now you wish perhaps to learn of less familiar traps Beware of herd, a dreadful word that looks like beard and sounds like bird. And dead, it's said like bed, not bead. And goodness sake, don't call it deed. Watch out for meat and great and threat. They rhyme with sweet and straight and dead. A moth is not the moth in mother, and nor both in bother, broth in brother. And here is not a match for there, nor dear and fear for bear and pear. And then there's doze and rose and lose. Just look them up, goose and choose. And cork and work and card and ward and font and front and word and sword. And do and go and thwart and cart. Come, come, I've hardly made a start. A dreadful language, man alive. I mastered it when I was five. So there's your you know, English, the, the, the spellings. And in fact, when we are teaching phonics, what do we tell children? We tell them that these are tricky words, right? Because they don't follow rules. So I think this is a fun way of, you know, bringing out the exceptions of English spellings. A lot of languages don't have this because a lot of languages follow a very, uh, you know, rule, uh, follow rules a lot more when they're spelling. But English, of course, as you know, has borrowed, has adapted has adopted from numerous languages all over the world and hence we have so many exceptions there are lovely poems on english spellings and please please bring them you know look them up and you can share them with your students and uh, a lingo a poem is also one such good example of course and uh, i'm glad that you think that using poetry in evs and math is a great thing uh, so i'm going to now Help see, uh, I'm now going to go on to how poetry helps students understand language structures. Now I'm going to read out a verse from my favorite poet, uh, Robert Frost's Nothing Gold Can Stay. In fact, it's a poem. It's one of his very, really wonderful poems. So please listen to it carefully because we are going to do something with it. Uh, Nothing gold can stay. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold. Her early leaves a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf. So Aiden sank to grief. So dawn goes down to day. Nothing gold can stay. Now that's a poem about, you know, the the transition, uh, the the you know the non-permanence of things, of beautiful things, right? That beautiful things are not permanent. We can't hold on to them. Now let's look at another story, The Touch of Gold. Again, it's about gold. And I'm going to again read it out to you, The Touch of Gold. The Greek king Midas did a good deed and Dionysus, Dionysius, the god of wine, granted him a wish. Midas asked for everything that he touched to turn to gold. Dionysius warned him that Midas wouldn't be swayed. Midas excitedly started touching everything and turning them things into gold. Soon he became hungry, but he couldn't eat anything because even his food turned to gold. His beloved daughter saw him in distress and ran to hug him. However, she too turned to gold. 
He realized then that the touch of gold was a curse. So we have, on one hand, we have a verse and the other we have a little story. So when we are teaching, uh, you know, poetry or when we're teaching language, we could use this, couldn't we, to help children analyze, see what's the difference in the structure, right? So can somebody tell me what is the biggest difference between this poetic, uh, you know, this verse and this uh, prose, piece of prose? Can somebody just put it on the uh, chat? Rhyme and rhythm, yes, poetry has rhyme and rhythm. What does prose have? Yes, poetry has rhyming, poetry has, uh, nature is described, yes, that's the meaning, yes. But we are looking at the structure right now. There's a rhyme scheme, there's no rhyme scheme in the prose, right? There are stanzas and paragraphs, absolutely. The story itself has stanzas and paragraphs, uh, right? And, uh, right, and one, the poem is a figurative meaning of gold, while the other is the literal meaning of gold. The poem has feelings imbibed in it. Absolutely, the prose is narrative. And the poetry has fewer, but fewer words, but more impactful. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shorter version, right? Paragraphs rather than verse and stanza. Absolutely. And apart from that, in this, these two particular examples, if you see, uh, poet, uh, the, the, the little story actually has characters. It's a story, right? It's a story with characters. Whereas this particular poem is not a story. Of course, there can be poems that are stories. But when we are asking children, say, to pick up, you know, when we take one particular abstract idea and ask them to compare the two, these are certain things that they can actually think about because the prose itself is about something real, something physical, like the actual goal. Whereas the poem has a lot more meaning hidden. And the story is direct. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now we are going to look at another example uh, of how, you know, the difference between poetry, how we can make children think about the difference between poetry and prose. So let's look at this on this uh, blacksmith. Blacksmith, a craftsman who fabricates objects out of iron by hot and cold forging of an anvil. Blacksmiths who specialized in the forging of shoes for horses were called farriers. The term blacksmith derives from iron, formerly called black metal, and farrier from the Latin ferrum iron. So that's an ex, you know, that's an um, that's that's a description of what a blacksmith is or what the word blacksmith is. Now let us look at this. There, I'm going to, sh I'm going to share a poem called The Blacksmith. Um, we don't know who wrote it, but it's there. Listen to it. Clink, clink, clinkety, clink. We begin to hammer at morning's blink and hammer away till the busy day like us a weary to rest shall sink. Clink, clink, clinkety, clink. From labor and care we never will shrink, but our fires will glow till our forges glow with light intense while our eyelids wink. Yes, onomatopoeia, right, absolutely. So um, here, as you can see, the poem makes it more vivid, more alive, doesn't it? The onomatopoeia, as you said, the onomatopoeic words or the sound words, clinkety clink, they they, you know, they actually make us imagine that blacksmith uh, through a, pro, you know, through the comparison. So if you help your students compare between the poetry and the prose, uh, students can understand the different structures and that itself can help them understand language because it gives them metacognition. You know, it's an understanding of how language itself works. So when you're reading out a poem, you, you know, you the intonation, the sounds, all of that makes a difference. And that's what students are picking up in their regular speech as well. If you think of, you know, very prosaic speeches as well, there's a repetition, there are onomatopoeic words, I have a dream. If you go through that speech, how many times is that repeated? Now that again is something very, very poetic, right? Even though the speech was not a poem at all. 
So uh, yes, literary devices are the basis of any good writing, but they're also absolutely right. But more than that, they're also the basis of hearing the language, you know, understanding how the language sounds so that when children speak, or when children, you know, use language in debates, use language in declamations, use language when they want to, uh, generally use language when they want to narrate, they or have all of this internalized from a very early childhood uh, manner, right? From very early childhood. And uh, so if students begin to recognize these predictable patterns through poems, they will be able to do that, you know, even when they are speaking. And I'm going to take you uh, just the predictable language patterns where there's familiar language, repeated words, phrases, lines. Again, as I said, uh, I have a dream that, that speech itself you know, because of its repetition. Listen to this. Uh, this is the charge of the light brigade. I mean, many of you will remember these words by uh, Tennyson. Forward the light brigade. Was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply. Theirs not to reason why. Theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. So as you can see, these predictable rhymes, these the noticeable rhythm, the auditory imagery, all of this will help children in speaking, not just understanding how language is used, but actually producing it. So, you know, we have the production skills and the uh, creation skills, right? So the product, so when they're actually producing it orally, the language, the poetry will, you know, if, if internalized, will help them with that. Uh, yes, Tennyson, yes, Kirti, thank you. Uh, often, you, I agree, the prose is dramatic too. I do agree with that. There is no doubt, poise, prose can be very dramatic. However, the whole idea here is to show how we use lab poetry to uh, help children understand the nuances of, you know, speech. So if uh, poetry is a lot more, you know, poems uh, in the middle school in early years, is a lot more manageable than dramatic poetry. And once it gets invited in them, obviously, when they you know move on to larger pieces of prose, uh, they can make their prose as predictable as they, oh, sorry, as dramatic as they want with all the nuances. Okay, so yes, we, we are getting there. I can see an anaphora on the screen. So we are going to look at figuring figurative language. And I'm going to um, share, you know, I'm going to show you a few of them. Let me see how many of you can give examples of the, of the figurative language, you know, the figurative devices I've put on screen. Let me see. Let's, let's come up with a few examples on screen right now. Yes, Pooja, they learn proper diction and they learn to pause and where to stress. Thank you. So poetry really helps them do that so that they can then translate that into prose when they are learning to uh, you know, read prose. Yes, light is feather. You have a metaphor, right? Your class is a zoo. That's a metaphor. Light is feather. Your simile. Excellent. Let's see. Let's have some more here. Let's see if you can give me examples of, say, cyanidope or metonymy or light totes or idioms. Innocent as a dove. Okay, so hungry that I can eat a whole park. The tree cried out loud. Lovely. Yes. Right? We are, we, we are turning the tree into a human being. So personification, right? As black as coal, yes. Let's see, 10,000 I saw at a glance, hyperbole, yes. From Wordsworth's daffodils, right? As fit as a fiddle, as wise as an owl. Beautiful. If I don't eat right now, I will die, hyperbole. You know, that's exaggerating. We have a mile high of files to look at. Lovely. Raining cats and dogs. Yes. Now let's come up with some more. Let's look at some examples. Would you, would you like to give some examples now of alliteration, assonance, consonance, allusion, cliche? Yes, we have turn a blind ear. Yeah, how can you turn a, turn a blind eye and then an interesting one, turn a blind ear. A piece of cake. I'm sweating buckets. Absolutely. Dancing leaves and whispering breeze. Personification. Beautiful. As cold as ice. My mother will murder me. Yeah, that's like, you know, 
certainly she <laughs> if i fare poorly in the examination hyperbole right so you lie to it using exaggerated language for the opposite effect break a leg or you know it's not the worst thing i've eaten means probably tastes good yes what about alliteration let's see are we getting boy bust around all our um you know our um, she sells seashells on the seashore right betty botter all of those the bench the team of yes the bench the team of lawyers um you know at autonomy right a crown the crown when we mean uh the king or the queen a bottomless sea on a so we have we have so many lovely examples and when we learn you know when we help our children start understanding these different dif different kinds of uh, figures of speech imagine how how we are enriching their own uh, not just their own language but the way they think but before i go on to how figurative language impacts the way we think i am going to do a little quiz can you figure it out can you tell me what this is oh my love is like a red red rose that's newly sprung in june can somebody tell me what that is is that what is it is that consonants is that metonymy clear close your cluttered closet i like that that's a simile lovely yes what about the next one she is all states and all princes i nothing else is all honors mimic all wealth alchemy by john dunn what is that yes the first one was a simile what is the second one the second one is not a spell it's a skunks what's the second one yes or from orchids education it is a metaphor right she is all states all princes all honors mimic lovely let's see the third one um and bells and buttons loops and lace so that nobody could ever see the face of the quongle wongle quake that's why edward edgar lear edward lear what is that what is the third one bells and buttons ha ah, i like this by ashish <laughs> the session surely super pass my senses the third one yes alliteration there's a lot of consonants bells and buttons loops and laces there's a lot of uh, there's some assonance quongle wongle right you have the vowel sounds yes it's all alliteration let's look at a few more quickly lend me your ears and i'll sing you a tune and i'll try not to be out of key this is by beatles a song by beatles what do you think is happening here lend me your ears and i that's that's yes repetitions the previous poem had repetitions what about the fourth one lend me your ears what is that what is that an example of personification yes it's it's, it's more of a metonymy where we are asking you know you to lend your ears sign it off okay um you know friends romans countrymen lend me your ears right it's give me your attention so we are using one part to talk of the entire thing another one here sorry standing in darkness with face upturned as frosty feathery stars drift down from the sky and like gentle kisses from cold lips on my cheeks my nose my lips and closed eyes what do you think this one is what is the what what figurative language are we using here or what is the main one here standing in darkness with face upturned as frosty feathery stars drift down from the sky and land like gentle kisses from your cold lips on my cheeks my nose my lips and cold eyes imagery yes priya mitra lovely i see that imagery yes what 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 is it creating it's creating a picture an image of snow of cold of the of the you know the snowflakes falling so lovely that's imagery and of course back to my favorite poet two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry i could not travel both what do you think we are trying what 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 is the one thing that stands out what one device stands out two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry i could not travel both
<laughs> she's a busy bee, yes. Let's see. What do you think two roads could be? Symbolism, perfect, Padma Balakrishnan. Lovely, yes. Two roads are a symbol of, of the choices we make in life, right? So, I mean, look at the power of poetry. And if we can imbibe all of these into our children in a very, um, you know, in a manner that they are not even aware of that. Remember, uh, just imagine how rich their language will become how rich their thinking will become. So, uh, and there is a reason I wanted to show you all this on the importance of uh, these figurative language the devices, because our language is nothing but using metaphors. The way we think is, is metaphors. You know, we think through metaphors, if you think about it. I mean, taking metaphors is the larger word, where a metaphor is... And, uh, you know, basically a word that is not a word by itself, but something else. So here as in this book, Metaphors We Live By, by Lakoff and Johnson, they say that metaphors are not just poetry or a literary device or figurative language, but a fundamental part of our brain's conceptual system. They're central to the way we perceive ourselves and others and the world. The essence of metaphors is understanding and experiencing one kind of thing in terms of another. So whether you look at a simile, whether you look at, you know, synodope, whether whatever the figurative language is, it's we're looking at language, uh, one thing in terms of another. They're not simply rhetoric or artistic or creative. They help us understand structure and communicate our experience. Our conceptual system is mostly metaphorical and the structure of the metaphor itself affects the word. So how do we describe this, you know, abstract things? How do we describe abstract ideas? Let's take a look at that. So how do we use figurative language in everyday life? How do we talk about something that isn't? My job is a jail. We are on the same page. You're out of your mind. What are we doing here? We are describing one thing in term of another, right? And these are all containers, if you think about it. A jail is a container, a page is a, you know, a container. You're out of your mind. So either you can be in it or you can be out of it. So whenever we describe anything abstract, ideas, uh, feelings, thoughts, emotions, concept, uh, concepts, we instinctively resort to metaphors. You know, let's look at this, life metaphors. Life is a game. So what are we, what are we talking about when we say life is a game? We, we think of it as something with chances, right? Comparative. Yes, we think of it as a competition. What about when life is a battle? When life is a battle, what do we think? How do we imagine life? How do we imagine life when we say life is a battle? Or what about when life is a journey? How do we imagine life when life is a journey? Right? We are talking about constant struggle, yes. Right? When it's a battle. So these are the different pictures we create in our minds about life through metaphors. And this is not poetry. This is not it's limited to poetry, but we use it all the time in language. Look at Shakespeare. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player. So what is life over here? Life is a stage, right? So he's comparing life to stage. How about when we have to make important decisions? What kind of metaphors do you think we use when we are making important decisions? Can you think of a decision, you know, a metaphor for decisions? Ups and downs in lives, okay, yes, chaos. But what about for decisions? For example, here, Life was a game. What is decision? If you had to compare a decision to something, what would it be? Yes, we could compare it to weight, right? How do we do that? When we are making an important decision, we weigh the pros and cons. We are exasperated with our kids because they refuse to see the gravity of a situation, right? So if you think of it, all of these comparisons are Yes, decision is a dice, right? 
So all of these, these are metaphors that we're constantly using. And if we can, you know, if you look at mask as a metaphor, the first one of the first poems that I read in this, uh, in the, this thing, in the presentation where, you know, she is, the mask is so much more perfect, but fake. So, but if we think about it, mask as a metaphor, what do we do? We wear a smile. Why are you wearing a frown? He wears his sorrows lightly. So, you know, we show the world our different faces. So again, we are making our students, we are, we are actually seeing the world through metaphors and, or similes. And won't it be great if we can make our students become aware of metaphors through poetry initially, so that it is easier for them when they use language. We are giving them metacognition as they navigate through language on their own. So, I mean, that way we are really, really using poetry to teach children um, language in a broader aspect, not just limited to, uh, you know, vocabulary or limited to uh, literal, you know, translations or meanings. So today we've, we've looked at a lot of things in this particular presentation, in this particular webinar, uh, how to teach language, you know, using poetry, so teaching language with rhyme and reason. We've looked at the rhyme, the rhythm, the reason behind using rhyme and rhythm to teach phonics. We've, we've looked at rhymes in different classes, whether EVS, whether science, you know, or, or math. We've seen how to use rhymes. Uh, we've, we've looked at vocabulary building, um, you know, uh, activities, and we've looked at other language, uh, you know, other um, devices for teaching language. We've looked at figurative language. We've looked at we've, we've we've actually gone through figurative language in everyday life, not just in poetry. Yes, inversion, absolutely. But what about this last bit? Poetry is a pleasure, not a strife. How many of you think poetry is pleasure? And how many of you think poetry is strife? It's challenging. Okay. Lovely. Okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to read out a poem, a very, very special poem to you, which has been written by Taylor Marley, who is a teacher himself, who is a teacher, but also a poet. And this is a po poem about you about me it's a, a poem about teachers so if you want you can close your eyes and just listen and you know get the pleasure out of this poem so sunday nights i lie awake as all teachers do and wait for sleep to come like the last student in my class to arrive like a builder builds or a sculptor sculpts a preacher preaches and a teacher teaches this is what we do we are experts in the art of explanation. I know the difference between questions to answer and questions to ask. I like to lecture on love and speak on responsibility. I hold forth on humility, compassion, eloquence, and honesty. And when my students ask, are we going to be responsible for this? I say, if not you, then who? You think my generation will be responsible? We are the ones who got you into this mess. And now you are our only hope. And when they say, what we meant was, will we be tested on this? I say, every single day of your lives. I just gave you what I knew you needed before you had to ask for it. Education is the miracle and I'm just the worker, but I am a teacher, and that's what we do. So what does what does Taylor Marley talk about teachers? What do teachers do? So you as a teacher, what would you do if you had to use poetry to uh, teach? Maybe not language, but just poetry to teach. Do you think we will be, you know, thank you, thank you for uh, the Rohini for saying that it's a beautiful, yes, it is indeed a beautiful poem by Taylor Marley. It makes us think, it makes us, you know, it resonates in our minds. 
And uh, so what we can say is that poetry is here for not as, you know, as a challenge for us to you to teach, but rather as a tool and as a very, very uh, pleasant tool that we can use for teaching, not just English, but any other language. So, Rhyme, Rhythm and Reason for Life, Poetry is Pleasure, Not Strife. A very, very happy uh, World Poetry Day to all of you. I will now hand over the uh, session to uh, Harsha so that she can make her comments. Thank you. Very, very welcome. Thank you, all of you, for your lovely comments. I hope all of you go and enjoy some lovely poems. Continuously, Harsha, we can't hear you. Harsha? Harsha? Yes, Harsha. Uh, look, am I audible to you now? Yes. Thank you for yeah, yeah, uh, bringing yeah, that up. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, I was the only very, one uh, apologies for that. Yeah. Thank you for the for a wonderful session, Alokprana, for engaging as well as informative session for our teacher community. Uh, I am sure that our teachers have got a lot and lot of takeaways from this session, such as uh, rhyme, rhythm, and reason. Then using poems for word and uh, concept association. Then understand uh, the language structures as well as the figuring uh, figurative language, as well as so many poems read out by you by so many poets written by so many poets it was uh, well, well uh, like uh, uh, informative session again uh, yeah uh, we'll be sharing the record of participation for this webinar by tomorrow once uh, everyone uh, filling a fill, fill uh, after once everyone fill out the uh, feedback form link which is already shared to you in the chat box uh, yeah do attend our uh, next session on 28th march 2024. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today to register for more such upcoming webinars. Uh, so again, once again, on the chat box, please do fill in the feedback form and the code for this is 2143. I repeat 2143. And uh, you can watch the this particular uh, video on YouTube. Uh, once the streaming is done after after a few seconds from now uh, yeah uh, it was indeed very uh, informative session alok prana thank you for such a wonderful session thank you for all the participants uh, participating so thank actively you. Uh, involving yourself uh, thank you for this thank you so much uh, have yes, a nice thank you and i all. really like to thank you i'd really like to thank all the participants because everyone was uh, you know participating and what lovely comments you have uh, put in. I'm really, really happy that uh, I could have such a wonderful, uh, you know, uh, interactive session today. So thank you to all of you and a very, very happy poetry day. Go enjoy your poem. <laughs>